Hello world, this is Craig. Let's take a look at this 8155 on the SBC85. Now the 8155 is a really handy chip. Inside it has 2 kilobits or 256 bytes of static RAM. It has three ports. Two of them are 8-bit ports. One of them is a 6-bit port. And it has a internal timer counter. And in this video and the next one, we're going to talk about this timer. And in this first video, we're going to talk about programming the timer and how you use it. And actually, because reading the timer is more complicated, we're going to save a video just for reading the value in the timer. But on the way to doing that, let's look at something that's very interesting about the 8155. If we look at any of the chips that Intel made as part of the MCS80 or MCS85 system, so let's look, for example, at the 8255. You notice that if we want to address the ports that are internal to this chip, there's a couple of address lines. If we look at the spec sheet, there's A0 and A1 on the 8255, and that's typical for most of the peripheral chips. And the way those are used is that the address decoding selects this chip, and then A0 and A1 in the 8255 are used to determine which of the ports inside the chip you're talking to. But the 8155 and the 8755 are unique in that they don't have those address lines coming into the chip, even though there's multiple ports inside the chip that we're talking to. And the reason is because the 8755 and the 8155 were part of the Intel minimum system. And if we look, Intel, this is heavily documented in a lot of the Intel data sheets, where they have the minimum system, where you can take a... 8085 microprocessor and 8755, which gave us two kilobytes of EEPROM and two 8-bit ports that were PIN addressable, and an 8156 or an 8155, you add a crystal and you add a little and you add a few little components so that you can get a clean reset. And this was a minimum system. This is a single board computer that you could build that was no bigger than this. And in the day, this was a very useful and fantastic combination. But to get this so simple, what Intel did was rather than have any kind of an address decoding, they made it so that the 8155 and the 8755 could self-decode. So basically, you would have a means of selecting the chip, and you would use an address to determine which of the chips was selected. But once it was selected, the chip itself determined which port you were talking to by not looking at the address lines, but by looking at the, the address data bus as well as the ALE, which is the address latch enable, and the IOM, which tells you if you're doing an IO bus cycle or a memory bus cycle. When you look at the 8155, it's very interesting that you can see that the ALE and the IOM come into the chip itself rather than just the chip select and the address lines directly, like any of the other peripherals. So as far as I know, these are the only two peripherals that did that, the 8755 and the 8155, 8156 family. So that's a little bit of an interesting aside, and that's why we see this chip to be a little bit different, because it was part of this minimum chip system. Okay, to communicate with the 8155, either the I.O. ports or the timer internally, we use the in and out instructions to address the internal ports that are in the 8155. So there's six ports inside the 8155, so once the chip select has been determined using the address decoder, we select the chip, and then within that chip, we have six ports that we address. So basically, the upper five bits of the port address are used to decode which device the system is enabled. And then the lower three bits in that are used to determine which of the registers within the device is being accessed. And as I mentioned earlier, the only difference between the 8155 and the 8156 is the logic level of the chip enable. And that just allows you to simplify the system sometime. So these are the six ports inside the 8155. If the low three bits are zero, we're writing to the command register and we're reading from the status register. That's one thing you'll notice that with all of these ports, when we write to the port, we're writing to one latch, but when we're reading from the port, we're reading from somewhere else. So in none of these are we getting the value back that we just wrote. If we have a certain address, we write to it, we're talking to one thing, when we read from it, we're reading from another thing. So if the three bits are zero, we have the command register that we write to and the status register that we read from. 
The next three are for the ports A, B, and C. We're either writing to the output latch or we're reading from the input multiplexer. And then the top two, values 4 and 5, 4, we're writing to the timer value low byte. And if we read it, we're getting the actual count or the remaining count. And the highest one, we're writing the timer mode and the timer value high 6 bits. And if we read it, we're reading the remaining count high 6 bits. And we're accessing these just using in and out instructions and the port address. So on version 1, the port addresses are 40 to 45. And on version 2, the port addresses had to be moved up because of our larger memory that we have down here. So on the version 2, the port addresses are A0 to A5. Now the internal timer in the 8155, sometimes it's called a timer and sometimes it's called a counter. But actually, it's a counter that decrements. So really it is a counter, but if we have it connected up to a clock, then we would normally call it a timer, and that's how it's used on the SBC85. It's connected to the system clock that comes out of the 8085. In practice, however, you know, back in the day that input was used quite frequently for a, a mechanical input. You know, you debounce it and it would be something like a shaft encoder or some kind of a sensor pickup that would tell you how many times something has happened without having to have the microprocessor sit there and watch that input constantly. So it was designed to be something that could either be mechanically driven or it could be just connected to the system clock. And as you can see from the spec sheet, there's just two lines that control that timer in addition to the two ports. There's a timer clock, and every time that timer clock sees a pulse, it decrements the timer. And then when it gets to a terminal count, it toggles that timer out. Normally the timer out is high. When it gets to the terminal count, that timer clock will go low. And we'll talk about the two different modes that that happens in just a minute. Intel also made the 8255 that we looked at a little bit earlier. That one has three timer counters inside. So it was very convenient for doing three axis machine control. Okay, so let's talk about actually using that timer. When we use the timer, there's three controls that have to be understood and set. They're the mode, the count, and the state. So first let's talk about the mode. When we talk about the mode, we're saying what type of an output is the timer going to have. So we can either have a timer that counts along and at a certain point it reaches a terminal count, it goes low, and it's going to finish the count, reach the new terminal count, and go high again. And if it does this, we would call this a bistable because it's either happy being at the top, it's happy being at the bottom, and for this particular timer, this is generally pretty close to a square wave. The other way that this could operate is that it could operate basically as a monostable where it goes along, it does the first half of the count, it does the second half of the count, and then when it reaches the terminal count, it has a very short pulse that goes low and goes back high again. Okay, so these are the two modes that this timer can operate in, either in the bistable mode or in a monostable mode. Now, once it gets to the second terminal count and it comes back up to the high point, it can do one of two things. It can either just stop, so for example, this would then just, it would do that one square wave and then it would go on forever. Same with this one, it would do that one pulse and it would go on forever. Or once it reaches that point, it can reset itself. So it can get back to the high point, it can reload the count, and then it can do the same thing again. It can do another square wave and just repeat that forever. This one would come in, it would do the first pulse, get to the first terminal count, it would then reload itself, it would go do another terminal count, reload itself, and so forth. So these are the four modes of operation of the timer. And as you can imagine, they have numbers 0 through 3. This one is represented as 0, 0. This one is represented as 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So these are the four modes that the timer can operate in. These are what you would think of as a one-shot. So the first step in using this timer is to decide which of these modes is best for the application. Now on the SBC85, the output of the timer goes into the interrupt, the 5.5 interrupt of the 8085. Now the 5.5 interrupt is a level triggered interrupt. So because of that, we can't use on this particular application these two modes because this pulse width is too narrow for that 5.5 interrupt to see it. This pulse actually only lasts one clock tick. And that's much too short for the 5.5 to see that. If we were using the 7.5 or an edge triggered interrupt, 
where all we needed was a single edge, then either of these would be fine. So the first thing to think of is whatever you're sending this signal into, can it detect this very short pulse? And if it can, that's fine. If it can't, then you're limited to using the longer square wave pulse. Okay, once we've decided what mode we're going to operate in, we now need to decide what do we want to use for a count. Now, the count is going to be just the period. It's going to be from the very beginning until it has gone through this entire square wave. Or in the case of the one shot, it's going to be from there to there, and that's going to be the period of the counter. So we decide what that count is, and that's going to be a 14-bit value. That 14-bit value is split into two bytes when we write it. The first one is the low 8 bits, and that's going to go out to port either 44 or A4, depending if you're using version 1 or version 2 of the hardware. And then the top 6 bits are combined with these two mode bits to create another byte, and that is written to the highest port in the system, which is port 45 or port A5, again, depending on which hardware. So you create the value that you want this to count down from. You do something like a MVI into the accumulator, the value, and let's say your value is 3, 2, and then you would simply do an out 4, 4, and then you would load the new value, say MVI A, uh, let's say we want to do a C0, and then we would do an out 4, 5 or these would be A4 and A5. Okay, so that's how we load our count and our mode into the timer. The third thing we need to do is after we've picked our mode, we've loaded out our count, is we have to then tell the timer to start. And that's done using the command status register. So if we look at the command status register, there's two bits that are dedicated to the timer. And in those two bits, we have four choices. The first one is 00, zero and that's a no-op. The reason we have the no-op is so that we can output port commands without affecting the timer. Unfortunately, the opposite isn't true. There isn't a way to write to the timer without affecting the port. So we have to remember what we've written to the ports, but we don't have to remember what we've done with the timer because we can always just issue the no-op when we're doing a port instruction and we don't want to change what the timer is doing. So that's what the 00 is for. That's just a no-op. We can issue a 01, which will stop the timer immediately if it's running. If it's not running, it is just a no-op. We can do a 1-0, which stops the timer when the terminal count is reached. So two different stops. One stops the timer immediately, and the other one stops the timer when it's done. Or we can load a 1-1, which loads the timer count, and then it starts or it restarts the timer. Okay, a little bit of critical knowledge here. If we actually look at what's going inside this timer, when we do our out instruction, that goes into a port latch, so that's the latch that's just triggered when we do the write instruction when that port is selected. And that's where we're writing our values, either it's the command register or it's the timer value. But let's say it's the timer value. When we do a run, the value that's in the port latch gets moved to the initial count value, and then every time it reaches the terminal count, that gets reloaded into a working counter. So this is a multi-step process. Now, when we do a read, of that same port. We're not reading either of these, we're actually reading what the working counter is. So if we do an in, this is the value that we're getting back, the working counter. So what this means is that when we do an out instruction, it is just saved in this port latch, and it doesn't actually get moved until we do the run instruction. So that means that if we want to change either the count or if we want to change the mode, we have to issue a new run instruction because that's the way that it gets from this port latch to the initial count. The two mode bits get peeled off and sent to the hardware that controls the counter, and then the initial count gets put into this register so it can be used whenever the terminal count is reached in the working register. So that's the first thing to note is that new modes or new timer counts loaded into the port do not actually get implemented until you do a run instruction. So that means that you can do a reload of a new value while the timer is counting, and it's not going to affect the operation of the timer. Another way to say that is the timer mode 
and the timer can be changed while the timer is counting, but it's not going to take those values until you have reissued a run instruction. So even if the counter is running, you have to reissue a run instruction if you want new values sent. A couple things to know. The longest count you can give is actually zero. And that's because it does a decrement first, like a lot of counters. So it, it doesn't look at the value before it decrements it. So the longest count you can give this is zero. The other thing to note, and we'll talk about this in the next video when we're looking at how to read the count, but this counter isn't working as simply as you would think. It's not just going, you know, eight, seven, six, five, four. It's actually counting down by twos. And what that means is since it's counting down by twos, if you load a one, that is an illegal value. Intel says that'll be unpredictable, but what I have found that if you load a one, it pretty reliably counts as if you had loaded a two. So it, it turns the one into a two. Okay, another thing to note is that it uses the run instruction to move what is in the port latch into the initial count. And then from then on, the working counter just reloads itself from the working, from the initial count. If you're doing one of the modes that repeats itself, so either a mode one or a mode three, there's going to be one more tick after you do the run instruction because that first tick is used to load everything. So if you load up a value of five, what's going to happen is as soon as you do the run instruction, it's going to take the first tick before everything gets set up. And then it's going to start counting down from the value of five. After everything is loaded, the next cycle is going to have a true count of fives. Where the first one had a count of six, everything after that is going to have a count of five. Okay, another thing to note is that if you load an odd count, what happens is the first half of the square wave is going to be longer than the second half of the square wave. So if you load a five, this one is going to have three ticks in it, and this is going to have two ticks in it. So just keep in mind that if you load an odd value, the first half is going to have that extra tick. We'll talk about more about that odd value loading in the next video where we're talking about reading this value because it gets a little bit more in-depth and complicated about what we're actually reading when we read this working counter. All right, so I think that's everything you need to know to actually get this counter going. And I think probably in the next version of this board, we will make it so that the input to the 8155 isn't just the clock, the system clock. I think we'll actually connect that to a connector. So if you want a mechanical input or you want something else to count the number of ticks, you can use it rather than just the clock. But at any rate, right now, the port numbers are on the schematic. So these are the port numbers for the 8155. So remember, just pick your mode, pick your count, and then write the start to the command register, and the timer will take right off. So that's it for this video. In the next video, we'll talk about reading that count back, the remaining count, and that's where this counter actually gets interesting, so I hope you watch that one. In the meantime, I hope you got something out of this. If you have anything to say, let me know in the comments below. I appreciate you watching. Bye-bye.